The Flash Forge Adventure 4. Is this the 3D printer you've been waiting for? Let's find out in this video. This printer has been sent to me by Flashforge for free, but this is an independent review as you will see throughout the video. I did run this printer for over 225 hours, printing different materials in my lab and not to spoil it too much, but I can tell you it has been a journey with ups and downs. You'll see in a bit. We have video chapters in this video, so you can jump to any part you want, but I really appreciate if you watch the whole video. But let's start at the beginning. Unboxing this printer was actually more difficult than I expected because it's such a huge thing to take out of the packaging box and it doesn't have side handles at the top but you have to hold it at the very bottom. I didn't want to destroy the packaging just yet and so I somehow managed to get it out and onto the table without dropping it. Getting all the foil and protective foam out of the printer took me about five minutes and then this beast was ready to go. It's really a lot heavier and larger than the Adventure 3. The manual describes the very basic steps quite understandably and getting your first test print seems not to be an issue. However, on my printer there was only this very simplistic tube ready to print. For everything else that you see here, I first had to use Flashforge's slicer software FlashPrint to prepare those parts for printing. So overall, uh, this printer is really easy to get started with for beginners who don't actually want to build a printer and mess around with cables and connections. Let's talk about the build quality and design changes over the Adventure 3 that I've already tested on this channel. So the first thing that's pretty obvious is that this thing is much, much bigger. The print volume has grown to be 220 millimeter wide, 200 millimeter deep, and 250 millimeter of maximum height. This puts this printer right into the speed spot for the average size of almost all printers being sold nowadays, like the Ender models or the Prusa i3, but with the difference of having an enclosed printing area, which might come in handy for specific materials like ABS or ASA. The quality of the housing seems to be really good, all the parts are flush and the plastic seems quite rigid and it doesn't have any sharp corners or edges on the outside. At the side we now have a larger spool holder that's finally able to hold a one kilogram spool. That's an improvement over the Adventure 3. There's a color touch screen here at the front where you can basically do anything to control the printer and monitor your prints. A USB port for uploading prints and downloading images and videos from the camera is down here at the front. At the side there is a power connection, power switch and ethernet port. But this printer also supports Wi-Fi, that's what I was using mostly during my tests. Inside you see this is the usual Cartesian setup with dual Z-axis drive, a single color Bowden extruder. Unfortunately there is no leveling probe on this printer and there is no option to add one later. The print bed is a removable magnetic metal sheet with a self-adhesive build tag like plastic surface. The magnets and bed surface should be working up to 110 degrees Celsius due to the specifications. I had one issue with this extruder connection cable being too short, probably an issue that was overlooked in the factory. I figured that I could get a little extra cable length by untangling this cable from its top holding bracket and letting it out here three centimeters below. This didn't have any negative impact on the prints, but it's definitely something to watch out for. So if you also run into this problem, you know how to fix it. So how easy is it to get started printing something new for beginners? Since this printer doesn't have a bed leveling probe, you should do an initial leveling first using a piece of paper. Flashforge says the platform is leveling free, means it is supposed to be less than 0.15 millimeter height differences between any points on the build plate. Still, the firmware does offer you to do a nine point manual leveling instead of just doing one for the center. However, I found the problem with the printer firmware is that you can only set the distances in 0.1 millimeter steps and nothing smaller. So it was quite impossible for me to set all nine points to the exact same level of distance. 
I wish there would be an option to select between 0.1 and 0.01 millimeter steps to adjust them more precisely as other printers do offer this as an option. The next step would be to prepare a 3D model for printing. You will need to install the FlashForge flash print software on your computer and when you first start it, the only thing to select is the correct printer model. You can simply load a new 3D model into the working area and if it's sized and positioned as you wish, you start slicing it. In the basic mode, all you have to select is the type of material. These presets mostly work fine, but if you need more control, you can always switch to expert mode and change all the settings you want. One thing I would consider to switch off most of the time is the raft. The raft usually is supposed to help prints sticking better on the surface, so it is an additional layer of material that is larger than the model's bottom and you have to remove that from the print later. Sometimes this can be quite hard without leaving any visible artifacts on the print bottom. It might make sense to have this on for parts that have a very small or narrow bottom surface. After slicing you may just copy the resulting file to a USB stick or alternatively send the file directly to the printer over the network connection if you have connected it already either using Wi-Fi or the Ethernet connection. The Wi-Fi connection is sometimes a bit unreliable for copying very large prints over to the printer, so I would rather use the Ethernet connection or the USB port for files that are really large, like the 100 megabytes I had to send over for this ghost print here. Using the printer over a network connection also has the advantage that you can monitor the print from anywhere in the network using flash print and you can also turn on the camera to see if everything is going fine. However, the camera that's built into this printer is really barely good enough to see what is happening. If you're running the printer only with the built-in LED at the extruder in a dark room, the image is super noisy and it's really hard to see anything. But if there's an external light source or daylight, it gets much better, but still not as good as a webcam, for example. You can turn on a time-lapse function in the printer menu, which is more a gimmick as it produces only mediocre quality time-lapses, nothing that remotely compares with Octolabs or with a webcam or a high-quality camera. So this is good for taking a quick look on what's going on, but nothing more. All my test prints in summary, not including some failures, took over 225 hours to print. Everything has been printed with the default speed settings of 50 mm per second in 0.2 mm layer height. I tested PLA, PETG, ABS+, ASA and NinjaFlex on this printer. I also used printing temperatures between 215 degrees for PLA up to 260 degrees for ASA and the bed temperatures have been between 45 degrees for PLA and 110 degrees for ASA. Strangely, FlashForge delivers two different nozzles with this printer. The standard one goes up to 240 degrees printing temperature and there's this high temperature nozzle that is rated for 265 degrees. But I don't quite understand why you would want two different nozzle types Honestly, I have used the high temperature nozzle since the PETG, ABS Plus and ASA test prints. By the way, printing these high temperature materials usually means those are going to emit some particles or doors, toxic fumes. And that's why it's good that this printer has an air filter that you can replace and probably you can just take a better filter if you want and put it in here as a replacement. So how did the test prints come out in the end? There's good things and not so good things to report. So first of all, if your print is sticking well on this print surface and doesn't detach during printing, you can expect to get really good results with all kinds of materials. The surfaces and details of all these prints look really nice. Overhangs are good, stringing is under control, there seems no issues with ringing or salmon skin or such. The lithopane print came out really nice and clean. I really like how smooth the backside is and how much detail we can see in the picture. The Necromancer bottle done in vase mode print is also turning out really nice. It's not watertight at all, but it looks awesome. 
By the way, I really can highly recommend to check out Clockspring's patron page. I really like his industrial designs. I printed this awesome skull replica in Prusum and Orange PTG. This had a nice place at our entrance door at Halloween. The carabiners printed in ABS Plus are really strong and rigid, turning out nicely. The small ghost printed in ASA looks also nice, especially when you put a lamp inside. This looks really spooky, but it also partially detached in one corner of the print bed, probably due to this front side being pushed down by the nozzle a little bit more than in the corner. This flexible wallet printed in Ninja Flex TPU turned out to be actually better than I thought on this printer. So this printer definitely can print flexible materials, although it is a Bowden system. But you have to print it very, very slow, not faster than 15 to 20 millimeter per second. Honestly, there is two major things that bothered me with a lot of these test prints. First of all, not having a bed leveling probe and not being able to set the nine point bed leveling distances in smaller increments causes inconsistent adhesion in different areas of the print bed, especially with larger prints. So it could happen that in one corner the print sticks super well and in the opposite corner it detaches. The next issue is the surface itself. I said this multiple times already in other reviews, for example, with the Ender 3 Pro plastic build sheet. I don't really like them because if you print something at higher temperatures, things tend to stick so much that it gets super hard to remove without destroying the bottom layer. This waste print I had to do twice because the first try was sticking so well that I broke it during removing it from the bed. The second one was slightly better as I increased the nozzle distance a bit, but still a few parts sticked too much and broke off here at the bottom. If you think that parts don't stick enough, you should use an adhesive spray like 3D Lock or Hairspray instead. So if you've seen my other videos, I switched to these PI coated spring steel sheets on all of my printers for the simple reason that this material is very sticky when it's warm and prints remove easily when it cools down. So my recommendation for anyone considering this printer is to get another spring steel surface from a third party and fit it on this printer. Still, I wish I had the chance to add a bed leveling probe to make the whole calibration process more precise and straightforward. Let's briefly talk about the noise levels of this printer. Overall, it's not really a quiet printer. The fans are rather loud even when the door is closed. Another disappointment is that the stepper drivers that run the motors aren't silent, so the motors make these high-pitching noises when moving. I was expecting this to be a thing of the past nowadays, but Flashforge obviously didn't decide to invest in some decent drivers for these motors, or if they did, the firmware doesn't support it properly. So with all the things said in this video, I would only recommend this printer if you need an enclosed printer with a market standard print volume. And if you're willing to accept that you cannot change or you don't want to modify anything regarding the hardware or the software. The print results are quite good. The firmware works pretty well. Together with the flash print software, it's really easy to get things printed from model to result. The price, however, will push back a lot of people as it's not exactly low budget at around 800 to 900 euros or dollars. I'm personally happy to modify my printers to my needs, but I can imagine this could be a printer for a small business where you want to print prototypes of designs in the office or if you don't want to care much about how the printer works and tinkering is anyways not something you want. So definitely check out the links to further information and purchasing options in the video description. If you are still interested in an enclosed printer that is more affordable and smaller, check out my Adventure 3 review here and I'll catch you in the next video. So let's get this thing out of here.